Hey all, in this last lecture in our series on biotechnology, we're going to talk about a couple of ways that we can measure gene expression. Our focus here is going to be on measuring expression of mRNAs. We're going to talk about three different ways in which gene expression can be measured. The first two techniques are ways to measure the expression of single or small sets of genes. The third way is a global genome-wide analysis. The first one we're going to talk about here is what's known as reverse transcription, PCR. We've already talked about the process of reverse transcription in which mRNAs are reverse transcribed using an oligo-DT primer and reverse transcriptase into a cDNA. This cDNA then can be amplified by PCR to produce many fragments. In reverse transcriptase PCR, after the PCR process, we usually find that the DNA that has been PCR amplified is separated by gel electrophoresis. And that's what's shown in the image on the left below. You can see in this image that the genes GAP-DH and CXCL12 have been reverse transcribed and then amplified by PCR. These then were separated by gel electrophoresis from different samples. In this particular experiment, GAP-DH, uh, which encodes for one of the enzymes that's, uh, per, that is required for the process of glycolysis, is actually our housekeeper gene. Uh, it also functions here as a control because it's believed that GAP-DH within cells is constitutively or always expressed, and it's typically always expressed at the same levels within a set of cells. And so you can see here that there's very little variation in the amount of GAP-DH. On the other hand, the amount of CXCL12 that's being detected differs from one sample to the next. What researchers do in a reverse transcription PCR is they measure the intensity of their gene of choice, in this case CXCL12, and divide the intensity of that band by the intensity of GAP-DH to get the data that is shown in the graph here. In this way, then, we can see that the researchers are comparing the amount of CXCL12 relative to the amount of GAP-DH in each of these samples. This technique allows researchers then to compare the expression of a single gene among different samples or different cell types. Now, reverse transcription PCR is a great method, but there are some limitations to it. And before I get into those limitations, let's take a look at this graph here, which the green line is showing us the amplification of DNA through the process of PCR. You'll remember that this amplification is exponential, which is being shown on the left-hand side of this graph. But toward the end, what we find is that the amplification of DNA in reality is not exponential, and in fact, it becomes inhibited for reasons that we're not going to discuss right now. Now, the limitation of reverse transcription PCR is that it measures the DNA in this non-exponential phase. And so if researchers aren't careful, um, they may not be able to see true differences in the expressions of genes between two samples. Well, to rectify this issue, some researchers developed a method in which they could use fluorescent dyes that would bind DNA in which they could detect the fluorescence after each cycle using a camera and a laser light. And this is known as quantitative PCR or qPCR. So the goal of qPCR then is to measure the expression of genes within this exponential phase before amplification plateaus off. Now here is some real life RT qPCR data. Again, what we're looking at here is the amplification of our genes of interest and the amplification of the control or those housekeeper genes uh, in this qPCR process. 
Now, without getting into too much detail, what researchers would be doing is calculating a cycle number at which each of these amplifications have passed what's called a threshold. Using that data, researchers can compare the expression of genes of interest between two different samples in a manner that we saw previously with RT-PCR methods. So let's finish our conversation here talking about how we can measure gene expression from a whole genome using microarrays. We've already talked about how to analyze these microarrays, but I want to take a step back and talk about how do we get to the step of actually producing these. Well, the processes are the same as ones we've talked about within this section. Again, we have mRNA that's going to be reverse transcribed using reverse transcriptase into cDNA. But in this case here, we're going to use nucleotides that are fluorescently labeled to produce cDNAs then that are labeled. Typically, the two colors or the two fluorescent dyes that are used here are ones that will give a green or a red color to the cDNAs. These cDNAs are then hybridized to our microarray chip. When hybridization occurs, we find that the cDNAs will bind to what we call probes that are specific for various genes. For example, in this image here, here are the probes for a particular gene, and you can see that no cDNA is binding to it. Over on the right-hand side, we have probes that are being bound by cDNAs from our green sample, which in this case would be a healthy sample. And on the far left-hand side, we see cDNAs being bound by, uh, to uh, probes from cancer samples. So what do all of these techniques have in common? Well, one, they all measure expression of mRNAs. But two, they all begin with this basic technique of taking mRNA and reverse transcribing it into cDNA. Other techniques that could be used to measure gene expression would be techniques that focus on measuring protein levels. If you're interested in topics like this, I suggest that you take a look at what's known as a Western blot. Until next time, take care.